Oh boy, so this is a lot of pressure this year, I think. <laughs> so this, this talk is going to be a little bit um, different, I think, than last year, and uh, in some ways a little bit more complex, because the topic that we're addressing is a very, very complex one. Um, I think the job's a little bit easier for me now that I follow some uh, really great talks from earlier this morning, um, teaching all about immunotherapy and how we develop drugs and so forth. So, so I'm hoping some of this will, will go uh, fairly clearly, otherwise we can, we can do questions later. But what I'm going to be talking about is um, some of the work that we've been doing in harnessing the immune system for the treatment of, of melanoma and other cancers. Um, so this is a very simple slide, obviously, that kind of shows you how the immune system works. And um, I think what's become clear over the years is that it's not, it's not enough to just try to use drugs to kill the cancer itself. We have to think about the rest of the body because everything that we're doing affects not just the tumor cells, but also the normal cells, the normal blood vessels, and the immune system. Um, and so really as we develop treatments to try to fight cancer and melanoma in general, we have to think beyond the tumor cell. Um, and one of the key components then is the immune system. And so this shows you some of the key components of that immune system uh, kind of response that we're trying to, to modify. And here, these gray things are the cancer cells. Um, you heard about antigens before, which are these little pieces of proteins that sit on the cancer cells, those, those yellow stars there. But if you need to mount a response, an immune response to cancer, you have to do a few things. Those tumor antigens have to be taken up by these special cells called these antigen-presenting cells or dendritic cells. And so that's what's going on there. Then those antigen-presenting uh, uh, cells have to go to the lymph nodes, uh, lymph system where it can pre present that antigen to those T cells, those warriors that Dr. Piero was talking about. And then you have to mount uh, an effective response, make a lot of those warrior T cells, and then they can go back and fight the cancer. But how can we modify this to make this a more effective um, process? Well, one, we can try to enhance the ability of um, the uh, dendritic cells or the antigen presenting cells to present things to the T cells. Um, and, and I'm not going to spend too much time talking about that. But two, we can try to promote the production of a protective T cell response, or that is, um, allow the immune system to make more of those T warrior cells. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about how we can do that. And another thing that we can try to do is overcome uh, immunosuppression within the tumor itself. So it turns out that um, even if immune cells can get within the tumor, and we talked about tumor infiltrating lymphocytes and so forth, even if the cells can get there, the tumor can kind of shut those cells down, just, just kill those immune cells. So even if they can get there, they can't do anything. Uh, and so there's, there's some therapies that we can use now to try, to try to do that. This is a slide that I showed last year um, showing where we were in 2010 in terms of FDA-approved drugs for melanoma. And it was really depressing to talk about melanoma back then because this is basically what we had. Two of these drugs, interferon and high dose IL-2, were nonspecific immunotherapy. So even back then, we were trying to you know, harness the immune system to fight cancer. But it really wasn't until 2011 uh, when ipilimumab was approved. And as you know, this is uh, an anti-CTLA-4 antibody. And this is really a major breakthrough in terms of cancer therapy and certainly melanoma ther therapy. And ipilimumab um, is an antibody, it's a protein that binds onto CTLA-4 and shuts that thing down. And by doing that, it allows the system, your body, to mount a more effective immune response to therapy, <laughs> to uh, the cancer. And so what I'm going to do is talk about some of the things that we've learned from ipilimumab. And it's really been a great tool to help us understand the immune system, the immune response to cancer, and how we can use this to, to develop better therapies. And one, we know that modulation of immunological checkpoints, like that CTLA-4 thing, can induce clinically relevant anti-tumor radiographic responses. That is, we can shrink tumor, and it can also help people live longer. And so um, you've seen uh, pictures before of patients treated with Gervoy. This is just another patient who was treated a long time ago in 2006. Um, at baseline, he had very little uh, liver lesions there. You can't even see them. And then, as you know, uh, ipilimumab is given IV. You get four doses once every three weeks. Um, and the approved dose, you get four doses, and that's it. So he got his four doses of drug in July of 2006. Uh, and then three months after starting, this is what the liver looks like. All of those spots are cancer. And as Dr. Piero said, if this was chemotherapy, obviously we would say, oh, this is not working. This is just worse. And we stop treatment. <clears throat> but eight weeks later, without doing any further therapy, um, most of these lesions go away, 
week 36, completely gone. This was in 2006, and this, this um, gentleman is still doing really great cancer-free, just after four days, doses of Yervoy. So again, we can do really great things with this uh, checkpoint um, blockade agent. And how about survival? So this is a survival curve. Um, and, you know, they look a little dry. It's not that pretty a slide, but there's a lot that we can learn from this. Um, basically, where we want people to be is here. Um, this is time, and this is the proportion of people who are alive. And you want everyone to be alive for a long time. So this is where you want to be. What we see here in these two red lines are patients who got ipilimumab on a randomized trial, either alone or with a vaccine. <clears throat> and this line here uh, is uh, patients who got the vaccine alone. And so what you can see here is if you got ipi, um, you're closer to where we want to be. It's not close enough, but you're closer. And this is really important because this is the first time we're actually able to do that meaningfully. Um, if you look at um, the percentage of people who are doing well at a year or two years, it's almost double. So at one year, if you got the vaccine, which is essentially a placebo, um, I, none of us believe, I think, that it does anything meaningful, about a quarter of people are alive at a year. It's not good. But we do double that almost with, with ipilimumab, so that's a big deal. But the, I think the important thing to see in this curve is this here, and this is what we call the tail of the curve. Because after, you, if you make it out to two years and you're doing well, most patients continue to do well for a long, long time, maybe even forever. And so we're able to cure these people. I think another thing that uh, is important to point out, and I think a lot of you guys are, it's, the melanoma community is very, very well informed, so I think a lot of this you probably already know, but what's interesting here is that you don't see a split in these curves. That is, you don't see a benefit with the ipilimumab until like three months. And so that's why we say it takes a while for this drug to work. Um, Dr. Hody, who was here two or three years ago, um, from the Dana-Farber presented um, a larger experience of ipilimumab in patients. And he looked at over 800 patients treated on phase two trials with ipilimumab, um, nearly 800 patients treated on two phase three trials, and compare that to kind of historical controls. And you know, what we see here is that at three years, um, about 22% of, of, of patients are doing well, alive, well, um, and again, you see the flattening of the curve there, that tail of the curve. So these are the people who are really benefiting from this immunotherapy. I mean, they're, they're, a lot of these patients are cured. And some of you guys are, are here in this room now. <clears throat> um, but what it also shows is how poorly people did before, how, how our treatments really were just not that effective. Um, and so with Yervoy here, um, you know, the, the median overall survival uh, it's, it's not great, um, but it's better where we, than where we were. It's, it's 11 and a half months, and that's better than nine months where we were before. Again, we still have a lot of work to go, but this was a major step forward. Now, we learned some other things from Yervoy, and we know that the, our increasing understanding of immune regulation is providing additional promising therapy, uh, therapies that we can use um, to fight cancer and melanoma. And what this slide shows is the T cell, that warrior t cell. And that T cell has a number of receptors on its surface that do different things. Um, and these receptors are kind of like switches. Um, these activating receptors, um, if they're switched on, if they're, if they're activated, then it basically allows the T cell to grow and do the things that we want it to, that is fight cancer. Um, but there are other switches, these inhibitory ones, that if they're switched, then they actually shut the T cell down. Um, and there are a lot of um, antibodies that are uh, in development now that Dr. Hamid will be talking about later on, uh, so I'm not going to touch on those. Um, but um, one particular um, receptor that, that um, is looking very, very promising is PD-1 or program death 1. And so I just want to talk a little bit about some of the data that we have from this antibody or from this target. Now PD-1, again, it's another receptor um, on the T cell. And this is different from the CTLA-4 um, CTLA um, protein. That is, the, the area where we are affecting the immune system um, when we use CTLA-4 or ipilimumab is kind of in the periphery, and it's at the level of antigen presentation. Um, and this is when the dendritic cell interacts with the T cell. Um, this is where Yervoy um, kind of affects things and allows the immune system to do what it has to do. PD-1 is different. This occurs at the level of the tumor in a large part. And Again, when the T cell gets into the tumor, I said before the tumor is able to kind of evade that immune system. And one way that it can do that is by having these things called ligands, PDL1 or PDL2, um, 
which bind onto that PD-1 thing that's on the T cell. And when that happens, it shuts the T cell off. So that's one of the ways that the tumor can evade the immune system. And so if we use antibodies, which again are just proteins to block that interaction, then we can let the T cells attack the tumor. Okay. There are a lot of antibodies now that are in development. Um, there are four antibodies that target PD-1, and um, we'll talk a little bit about nivolumab and lambrolizumab, which is a Mark antibody. Um, um, Genentech, um, Dr. Pramal's company, has uh, an antibody target targeting PD-L1. Um, and so again, there's a great deal of interest in, in targeting this part of the immune system. Um, I was fortunate enough to work on, uh, with uh, Suzanne, Suzanne Tapalian from um, Hopkins and Mario Schnoll from Yale um, in testing um, the, the, the uh, BMS PD-1 antibody. And so this is a very complicated plot, um, but I think we can learn a lot out of this. This is what's called a spider plot. So again, very complicated. Each line here represents a patient. And, and what we see here is the time on the x-axis, and this is a change in the, the size of the tumors on the y-axis. And so basically what we want to see is everyone's tumors shrink over time. That's what we want. And what you do see is a lot of patients do have tumor shrinkage over time. Um, and if we look objectively at, at kind of how we say who really has a response, we see that 28% of patients who are treated with this drug, with melanoma, actually had a, a really good response. And that's higher than what we see with Yervoy. With Yervoy, it's about 11%. 10 to 12 percent. What we also see here is that a lot of people treated with this drug develop new spots of cancer early on, um, but that doesn't mean that the drug wasn't working. So that's reminiscent of uh, ipilimumab. And so these kind of uh, red triangles there show when patients develop new spots. And you can see, for instance, this patient here um, develops a new spot there. The cancer is actually growing for a period of 20 to 30 weeks before it shrinks. So we can see those delayed responses that we're used to from CTLA-4 inhibition, um, but a lot of patients had immediate shrinkage. And so in some ways it's like ipilimumab, in some ways it's different. Um, this is the updated uh, data that was just published by Dr. Dipalian in the uh, Journal of Clinical Oncology. Um, and it, looking at 107 patients with melanoma treated on that phase one trial, um, median survival now is over um, 16 months. Okay, so we went from about nine months um, before we had ipilimumab to about 11 and a half months with ipilimumab, now to nearly um, 16 and a half, 17 months. So again, we're slowly making progress. I think this is, again, it's not where I want to be, but it is, it is progress. What we see at one year is about 62% of patients are doing well, alive and well. Uh, and that persists again at, at two years, we're at 43%. And again, we are starting to see kind of flattening um, in that curve. So I think this is something that we're going to have to see over time about how many patients we're actually able to cure with this drug. What we know also is that clinical outcomes and the toxicity profiles differ by the level of checkpoint blockade. And I guess the point here is that ipilimumab is not PD-1. Um, and so we can look at the side effect profiles and we can see that. And some of you have been treated with, with these two drugs, so you know by experience that it seems that the PD-1 antibodies tend to be less toxic. And so if we look at, for instance, patients who have what we call an immune-related adverse event, and these are things like the rash and the pruritus and the, um, the colitis, things like that, um, about 61% of patients treated with ipilimumab in uh, the original report um, had one of these immune-related side effects. Um, and if we look at nivolumab, the BMS PD-1 antibody, it's about 41%. Um, if you look at the rash and pruritus, it's less with PD-1 antibody than with uh, ipilimumab. Um, same thing with colitis and diarrhea. This is much, much less. Um, about 28% of patients treated with ipilimumab had diarrhea uh, versus 11% with uh, nivolumab. Um, the one thing that we should mention is that with nivolumab, we do see some side effects that we did not see with CTLA-4 before, and that's some of the lung side effects. Um, and that's something that we're very um, uh, cautious to look out for. <clears throat> this is um, kind of the more important thing, I think, which is the activity. How did patients do um, on the different trials of these um, agents? And you know, here we're looking at different trials that were not randomized, looking at different types of patients. So it's not fair to compare them head to head, but we'll do it anyway. Um, but what you can see here is ipilimumab, again, for the original report, the response rate, that is the likelihood of major shrinkage was 11%. Um, but if we look at nivolumab, the, Merck, or the uh, BMS PD-1 antibody, it's 31%. Um, and Dr. Hamid reported uh, the data on the Merck antibody, response rate's 41%.
And so by response rate, that is major shrinkage of the pd one antibodies seem to be a little bit more effective than ipilimumab. If you look at how long patients live, again, uh, we said 10.1 in the New England Journal report for ipilimumab versus 16.8 months for nivolumab. And then if we look at the people doing well at one years and two years, you can see that uh, with ipilimumab, it's 44 and 22%. For nivolumab, it's 62 and then 43%. And then with the Merck, anti uh, Merck PD-1 antibody, it was 81%. Um, and so the level of checkpoint blockade matters in terms of side effect and how well um, patients are going to do. Now, there's a lot that we don't know about these agents. Um, one thing is that we don't know what the relative contribution of changes in specific T cell population is. Okay, so this is complicated. I don't think I'm going to talk too much about that. That's a carryover from a, <laughs> another talk. But there are different types of T cells. There are different types of immune cells. And some of them are good in terms of developing an anti-tumor response, and some are bad. And you know, some of these therapies may be suppressing those bad T cells as opposed to turning on the good ones. Uh, and that's something that we have to work on and try to figure out. But obviously, we're trying to do better in terms of um, you know, helping patients um, get to cure. Uh, and so you know, another big question is, what combinatorial strategies will lead to the optimal efficacy? Um, and there are studies that have been done and are ongoing com combining ipilimumab with some of these PD-1 antibodies. Um, there's studies looking at ipilimumab, for instance, plus radiotherapy, plus uh, radiofrequency ablation and cryotherapy. Uh, we're looking at studies combining these checkpoint blockade agents with um, some of the small molecule tyrosine kinase inhibitors, like vemurafenib and things like that. And so this is going to be very important. It's actually very, very complicated to do. Um, this is work that was um, uh, conducted by Jed Wolchuk at Memorial um, and pub published in New England Journal of Medicine. Um, looking at the combination of nivolumab, which is a PD-1 antibody with ipilimumab. Um, and this is a waterfall plot. You've seen this before, where each patient is a bar. You want, basically, you want each bar to go down. That means that there's major tumor shrinkage. And what you can see here is that the majority of patients treated had tumor shrinkage. And a lot of these patients had major tumor shrinkage, with more than 80% of their tumor going away. And so this was very, very dramatic. Um, if we look uh, at response rate, which is rigorously defined, about 40% of patients had a response um, to therapy when we gave both drugs concurrently. Uh, and a lot of these patients were doing well for a long period of time. Um, uh, this is uh, work that was presented by Mike Postow uh, at Memorial. Um, but here you have the um, survival curve for patients treated with nivolumab alone, which I showed you before. And then this is what we saw with the combination. And so the one-year survival that is, the number of patients who are alive at one year was 82% with the combination versus 62% with PD-1 alone. So the combination might actually be um, better in terms of efficacy. The randomized trials have, have accrued, and so we're going to actually know that um, answer soon. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Patel was talking about how can we predict who is going to benefit from drugs like these AKT inhibitors. And so every time we're trying to develop drugs, that's what we're trying to do. We want to pick the patients, um, pick the cancer, pick the disease that's going to benefit from the treatments that we're going to do it, um, that, that we're going to use, and not use treatments if it's not going to work. And so these are called biomarkers. And so what we want to do is try to figure out what are the most predictive biomarkers for response to these drugs. And there are a lot of things that people have been looking at. A lot of these are um, still kind of um, being worked on. But I'm going to talk about some of them. Um, Mike Postow, again, has done a lot of work looking at something called the absolute lymphocyte count as a marker of response for CTLA-4 inhibition, for a marker of response to ipilimumab. Um, and uh, this is work that he presented last year, um, looking at patients treated on um, one of those randomized phase three trials of ipilimumab um, and the vaccine. Um, now, the absolute lymphocyte count is just really a measure of some of these immune cells. And so what he found was that patients treated with the vaccine alone, if anything, had stabilization, if not a decrease in the number of these lymphocytes over time. And this is week zero, week three, six, nine, and 12. But if you look at the patients who were treated with CTLA-4 inhibition, so IPI, or IPI plus the vaccine, you clearly saw that there was an increase over time uh, with treatment. Um, and so that was kind of, you know, this doesn't actually tell us very much by itself, but it's just a marker of activity. The drug is doing something to the lymphocyte count, so we can see that. This effect is dose-related. 
So um, this was a study done by Jed Wolchuk again, who looked at three different dos doses of ipilimumab, 0.3, 3 milligrams per kilogram, which is the approved dose, and then 10 milligrams per kilogram, which um, was used in a lot of the trials. And you can see that the rate of growth, that slope, increased with dose. So um, absolute lymphocyte increases with ipilimumab. It tends to increase faster with higher doses. But the important thing was this. If you look at the patients who had a high absolute lymphocyte count after therapy, um, those patients did better in terms of cancer control and living longer than patients who did not. Uh, and again, you want everyone to be there. So this curve is better. This is the curve of patients who had the high lymphocyte count. Um, and that was true both with a high dose of ipilimumab, so these patients had the, the rise in the ALC, um, as well as with the approved dose. And so this is a nice marker, perhaps, of, um, you know, when, when I treat patients with ipilimumab, I say it's going to take me probably four months to know if this drug is working or not. Right? And that's because we do the four doses, we get a scan, sometimes the cancer is bigger, and we just say, well, let's just wait, we'll do another scan in a month or so, and then we'll see. But here, at week seven, we might actually be able to predict, oh, I think it's working. And if that's the case, we continue on. Um, but if you don't have a high ALC, it, it might mean that it's not. It's not completely, it's not 100%, but that's what this data is telling us. When we look at PD-1, um, one of the big markers that we're doing is something called um, um, looking at PDL1 expression, or if we look at the tumor, um, do they have a lot of this thing called PDL1s, that ligand on the tumor that shuts down the immune cell? Um, and the way that we do that is um, with some staining called immunohistochemistry. And so what you see here is um, all these blue things are the nuclei of the tumor cells, um, but then you put a stain on it for this PDL1 um, protein, and that stain is the brown. And so you can see that some tumors have a little bit of brown, some tumors have a lot of brown. And so I think you've probably heard a lot about this PDL1 staining. This is what it looks like. Um, and so some tumors stain for it, some tumors don't. Um, this is work that was um, presented, I think, by Adil Dowd, um, but uh, Dr. Emid was on this trial as well of the Mark PD1 antibody. And what you see here is a waterfall plot. Again, you want each bar as a patient, you want everyone to go down. Um, and the patients who had tumors that express PDL1 um, are kind of that bluish green color, uh, and the tumors that it did not are kind of that more tan. And you can see that if you had a tan tumor, the tumor tended to grow. Um, if you had a, a PDL1 expressing tumor, those are the ones that tended to respond. And so indeed, if you look at the number of PDL1 negative patients who um, had a response, it was 44% versus 75% of the tumor did. So this might be one way for us to be able to predict who's going to benefit from PD1 therapy. But interestingly, um, that might not be the case for P all PD1 or PDL1 antibodies. This is the Genentech drug. Um, and what you can see here is that um, if the tumor had PDL1 expression, the likelihood of shrinkage was 30%. If it did not have PDL1 expression, not too much different. <laughs> so here, PDL1 did not seem to predict the ability of the drug to shrink tumor, but what it did predict is the um, number of patients who'd have some stable disease. So you do have an increased likelihood of disease control if your tumor has PDL1 expression uh, with uh, the Genentech drug as well, although it doesn't predict for shrinkage. Um, this is, um, again, looking at PDL1 expression um, in the nivolumab alone clinical trial and the trial uh, that we did with nivolumab and ipilimumab. And what's interesting here is, as I said before, for nivolumab, uh, the expression of PDL1 predicts for response. So for, if your tumor has PDL1 expression, 41% of patients will have tumor shrinkage versus 14% if you don't. But if you combine treatments, if you combine PD1 and CTLA4, that goes away. PDL1 is no longer um, predictive. And so if your tumor had PDL1 expression, likelihood of shrinkage is 46%, and it's 41% if you don't. So this whole PDL1 thing is very, very confusing. I think we're still trying to sort it out, see what it means. Um, but again, this is another biomarker that I think we're still trying to, trying to work on, again, to better select patients for this treatment. Um, if you go across studies, Again, we know that in terms of tumor shrinkage from nivolumab, it's been shown over and over again that if you have PDL1 positive tumors, you're more likely to have tumor shrinkage than if you don't. Um, not clear if that's true for PDL1, and doesn't seem to be true for combination therapy either. One final thing that we don't know, 
actually there are a lot more, but the last one I'm going to talk about now, and it's not too much actually, but is what, what is the clinical efficacy of checkpoint blockade beyond CTLA-4 and beyond PD-1, PD-L-1? Um, and, and this is a topic that I'm going to leave, leave for Dr. Hamid, uh, who I think will talk about all the new antibodies and drugs that are trying to uh, attack all of these other receptors. Um, I just want to kind of leave on a, a couple more slides that you know, as you know, in addition to ipilimumab, there are three other drugs that have been approved, vemurafenib, which is a BRAF inhibitor, dibrafenib, which is another BRAF inhibitor, and termetinib, which is the uh, MEK inhibitor. And these are all approved for BRAF mutant melanoma. But we know that melanoma is more than one disease, and a lot of work is going into developing therapies for NRAS mutant melanoma, and indeed there are some drugs like this drug MEK162, which seems to may have activity in this disease. We and others have shown that kit inhibition with drugs like imatinib um, can be effective in patients with kit mutant uh, disease. Um, and it looks like if we use drugs like selametinib, which is another MEK inhibitor against GQG11 mutant disease, we can have efficacy. The problem with these um, small molecule drugs is this. All of them, not all of them, a lot of them um, have a likelihood, a high likelihood of getting tumor shrinkage. So those of you who have been treated with vemurafenib, a lot of times we get really rapid and really dramatic tumor shrinkage. Um, and so response rates are on the order of 50%. But the problem is those responses don't tend to last that long. Um, and so on average, um, patients will have disease control for about five or six months, and then the cancer will grow. So that's a problem. And if we look at kind of the survival curves for the small molecule drugs, like vemurafenib, what we see is a shape like this that a lot of people do well for a little bit, um, and then the cancer starts to grow. And so with the small molecules, it seems that what we're able to do is get a rapid effect. We're able to shrink tumor fast, uh, and we're able to do that in a lot of patients. Um, but most, most tumors develop resistance and ultimately grow. Um, but it's interesting, if we look at the curve for the immunotherapies, like this is the epilimumab curve, this is what we see. Um, a lot of patients don't do well in the beginning, but we have that tail of the curve effect, and these are the patients who are able to cure. So with, with the immunotherapies, we have delayed responses. Uh, shrinkage tends to be a little bit less common, um, but we have this tail of the curve effect. And so with the immunotherapies, unlike with the small molecules, I think we have a higher likelihood of curing people. And so what we want to do is kind of get the best of both worlds, get the, get the, get the benefits of the small molecule curve, add that to the immunotherapy curve, and kind of get closer to our ideal line of, of being right there. And to do that, we're trying to do a lot of combination therapies, and this is just some work that we're doing at Memorial, combining ipilimumab or PD-1 or so forth with some of these small molecules to try to actually do that. So in conclusion, we do have a number of new immunothera uh, immunologic therapeutic targets that have been identified, and uh, that has led to the development of multiple effective treatments that, that really meaningfully improve outcomes for, for patients with metastatic disease. Um, we do need to do further work to identify biomarkers that are predictive of sensitivity, predictive of resistance to immunologic agents, um, and those biomarkers are likely to differ um, by agent and uh, mechanism of action. Um, the rational combination of immunologic agents, targeted therapies, and other treatment modalities may permit us to overcome um, the development of secondary resistance and increase the likelihood of cure. And, you know, although this recent progress in melanoma therapeutics has been really, really exciting, really significant, you know, we still need to continue to work together, and that's, that's the, the researchers, um, pharma the, the pharmaceutical companies, the doctors, um, and you guys to, to, really, to really get rid of melanoma once and for all. So I'll leave it there. Thank you.